Italy, a land where history whispers from every cobblestone and legacy shadows every monument, has long been a crucible of cultural and political might. This is a uniquely Italian story woven from the fabric of time, where power and ambition crafted a nation from a mosaic of city-states. And over the centuries, Italy emerged not merely as a unified country, but as a formidable power, shaped by the foresight and influence of a few select wealthy families whose names echo through history. Indeed, these dynasties, visionaries in their own right, navigated the intricate dance of diplomacy, war and marriage to forge a singular Italian identity. Today, we delve into the lives of these illustrious families, exploring how their strategies, alliances and rivalries sculpted a nation. If the Medici family were around today, they'd probably look at the Forbes rich list and chuckle. With a fortune that, in today's terms, would make them literal trillionaires, they were the kind of rich that makes today's billionaires seem like they're scrimping and saving for a rainy day. Indeed, the House of Medici didn't just have money, it had we-could-buy-countries-for-fun money. But Europe's ultimate financial old-money family weren't just spending for spending's sake. They were the original creators of modern finance. They didn't just invent the rule book of banking. They wrote it, published it, and sold it at a profit. Yet, behind all of this financial wheeling and dealing, there's a delicious irony. While they were busy counting their florins, they inadvertently became the reason that Protestant Christianity even exists. The Medici family members who became popes with their love for the finer things in life got under Martin Luther's skin so badly that he hammered his 95 theses onto the church door like a divine eviction notice. It's like hosting a dinner party and accidentally founding a new religion in the process. Meanwhile, in the world of art, the Medici were the ultimate talent scouts. They didn't just cheer on the greatest artists of all time, they practically paid for the Renaissance dream team. Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, Raphael, Donatello all got their starts directly from the Medici millions having a penchant for artistic endeavor. It's as if this European old money dynasty had a sixth sense for genius, along with a bottomless wallet to fund it. In essence, the Medici were the ultimate Renaissance multitaskers, part bankers, part religious revolution starters, part art aficionados. And in today's episode, we tell their full saga as we describe the Medici family, the family that owned the Renaissance. In the dazzling and tumultuous realm of Renaissance Florence, the Medici family ascended as an unparalleled titan of wealth and power, reigning supreme in both opulence and sway. Indeed, in terms of financial power and political clout, the Medicis were arguably the most powerful dynasty in European history, and the world would truly not be the same today without their influence. That still continues on into the 21st century. Now, this eminent family ascended to power in an environment that was as complex as it was captivating. Florence, during their time, wasn't just any run-of-the-mill feudal trading hub. It was a city-state. In other words, a city that operates as an independent political entity, with its own government, army, and, in many cases, currency. Furthermore, the Medici family's rise to prominence was intricately linked to Florence's political framework. Governed through a mix of elected councils and influential guilds, the city's governance was a complex tapestry of democracy and oligarchy. The guilds, which were associations of artisans and merchants, played a pivotal role in the city's economy and politics, and members of these guilds, often wealthy and influential, had the power to vote and hold office, thus directly impacting the governance of Florence. Thus, the Medici family, shrewd and ambitious, skillfully navigated this political landscape. They leveraged their economic success and social connections to gain influence within these guilds and councils and over time, they managed to embed themselves deeply into the very fabric of Florentine society. Their ascent to power, beginning in 1434 and enduring until 1737, was marked by the establishment of the Medici Bank. Under the astute leadership of Giovanni de Bici de' Medici, this financial institution grew to become the most powerful bank in the whole of Europe. And the creation of such a banking powerhouse in Renaissance Florence required not only financial acumen, but also a keen understanding of the social and political dynamics of the time. You see, the Medici family's adeptness in nurturing relationships with the city's elite and leveraging the political landscape enabled them to establish and expand their banking empire. 
and the Medici Bank's network spanned across pivotal European cities, including Milan, Venice, Rome, London and Barcelona, and many others. But the Medici family's dominance in Renaissance Europe wasn't confined to secular finance. They also wielded significant control over the papal treasury, intertwining their influence with the Catholic Church. Indeed, this treasury, crucial for funding church operations and activities like cathedral construction, art commissions, and maintenance of clerical roles, was a pivotal power source in both political and religious spheres. Thus, through this control, the Medici expanded their reach beyond mere commerce and banking, leveraging the church's vast societal influence. Furthermore, in terms of financial innovation, the Medici were trailblazers. In a masterstroke reminiscent of modern financial acumen, the Medici family introduced the letter of credit, revolutionizing Renaissance commerce. This instrument was a harbinger of banking convenience, allowing merchants to traverse the continent without the cumbersome need to carry cash, significantly mitigating the risk of theft. A simple yet potent promise from the Medici banks, the letter of credit was a precursor to the modern day check, fundamentally transforming the movement of money and trade across distances. And simultaneously, the Medici were pioneering the holding company concept. This savvy business structure, where a parent entity owned shares in various companies, provided them with control over diverse operations without direct involvement in day-to-day -day affairs. This strategic foresight not only consolidated the Medici power and wealth, but also laid the foundation for the corporate governance structures that are now commonplace in today's business world. Thus, in an age where such financial and corporate innovations were rare, the Medici's methods were not just ahead of their time, they were a blueprint for centuries of economic advancement. And the Medici's financial clout in today's terms would leave us all speechless. For example, Giovanni di Michi de' Medici, a forefather of this illustrious family, amassed a fortune equal to $36 million in his time, a staggering sum for the era. And if we were to apply a simplified inflation calculation, assuming, say, a rate of 3% over approximately 600 years, Giovanni's wealth balloons to an astonishing 1.8 trillion, yes, trillion with a T, in today's dollars. But the Medici wealth didn't peak with Giovanni. Historically, it is said that the family's net worth is pegged at around 129 billion US dollars. Using the same inflation approach, this figure skyrockets to a simply incomprehensible $6.5 quadrillion in contemporary terms. It's a figure that is larger than the entire GDP of the world, and thus it is indeed crucial to approach these calculations with a grain of salt. They rely on a straightforward mathematical model that doesn't fully account for the complex economic and historical shifts over six centuries. Nevertheless, these estimates give a glimpse into the extraordinary wealth and influence the Medici wielded. However, the Medici legacy is as much linked to their unrivaled patronage of the arts as to their monumental financial acumen. Their support nurtured the genius of Donatello, Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci, among others, turning their home city of Florence, originally a military camp established by Julius Caesar, into a hub of creativity, intellect and splendor from the 13th century onward. And even further, the Medici dynasty's impact went beyond arts and finance, venturing into the realm of politics and nobility. Their dominance over several centuries was so absolute that they crafted new noble titles for themselves, cementing their status in history. Indeed, from the moment the Medici family secured control over the papal treasury, their influence rapidly became apparent to the contemporary pontiff. He remarked about the family's patriarch, Cosimo de' Medici, with a mix of awe and perhaps a hint of trepidation. Political questions are settled in Cosimo's house, he declared. He is who decides peace and war. He is king in all but name. Yet this ascent to almost unparalleled eminence was rooted in a past shrouded in myth and legend. It's said that the Medici lineage can be traced back to the time of Charlemagne himself, which is where our next chapter picks up. It is said that the Medici lineage can be traced back to the time of Charlemagne, a figure of immense importance in European history. Charlemagne, or Charles the Great, reigned as the King of the Franks and Lombards, and later as the Emperor of the Carolingian Empire. His reign, spanning from 768 to 814 AD, marked a period of cultural and political resurgence, 
often referred to as the Carolingian Renaissance. The Medici family law goes that Averardo, a knight in Charlemagne's service, encountered and defeated a giant in the Mugello region, just north of Florence. This heroic feat supposedly left Averardo's shield adorned with dents from the giant's mace, a symbol later immortalized in the Medici family's coat of arms, a series of red balls on a gold shield. However, the real journey of the Medici family to prominence began much later. The true ascent of the Medici begins not on a battlefield, but in the humble lanes of the Tuscan village of Cafagiolo, and their journey to Florence marked the transition from mere merchants to influential figures. The path wasn't smooth, however. A notable bump occurred in 1382 when Salvestro de' Medici, then Gonfalonier of Florence, faced exile amidst accusations of tyranny. This was a temporary setback in the family's otherwise upward trajectory, when the Medici's true rise to power began with Giovanni de' Bici de' Medici. Initially a wool merchant, Giovanni capitalized on Italy's strategic position as a trade nexus between the East and the West. First, the Medici's 14th century Italian peninsula had access to the rich markets of the Byzantine Empire and the Islamic world, including regions as far as India, bringing in a variety of luxury goods, including silks, spices, and precious stones. Additionally, Italy's extensive coastline and well-developed maritime capabilities allowed for efficient sea trade. Italian city-states like Venice and Genoa became crucial maritime powers, operating fleets that dominated the Mediterranean trade routes. Moreover, Italy's position as a gateway to the rest of Europe meant that it was perfectly situated to distribute these goods from the east to European markets. The trade routes through Italy not only included maritime paths, but also a network of roads traversing the Alps and leading into the heart of Europe. This made Italian cities vital centers for trade and banking, attracting merchants, bankers and entrepreneurs from all over the continent. In this context, Giovanni's business acumen found fertile ground, and the bustling trade environment provided ample opportunity for a wool merchant to prosper. Next, his fortunes took a significant turn in 1397 with the establishment of the Medici Bank, and while it was initially just a side venture alongside Giovanni's wool workshops, the future financial behemoth quickly became his primary focus largely due to the lucrative and expanding opportunities in the financial sector of that era. Specifically, the burgeoning growth in trade and commerce across Europe was, at the time, accompanied by an increasing need for sophisticated financial services. These included currency exchange, credit facilities, and handling of large transactions, especially for the affluent and the governing classes. And the Medici Bank, with its innovative practices, filled this gap effectively. Furthermore, Giovanni's alignment with Pope Martin V was a strategic move that propelled the bank's success. At the time, Pope Martin V desired to re-establish the papacy permanently in Rome, after the Western Schism had multiple claimants to the papacy emerging, causing significant religious and political strife. The return of the papacy to Rome thus symbolized a return to traditional religious authority and stability, and by supporting Pope Martin V in this endeavor, Giovanni Medici positioned himself and his bank favorably within the realms of ecclesiastical and secular power. His subsequent appointment in 1414 to manage the apostolic chamber, the papal treasury, was a testament to this strategic alignment. And this role not only elevated the status of the Medici bank, but also granted it access to vast financial networks and significant transactions across Europe. Thus. The management of the Apostolic Chamber marked the beginning of the Medici's long-standing relationship with the papacy, intertwining their banking operations with the politics and finances of the Catholic Church. This connection was instrumental in the ascent of the Medici Bank to becoming one of the most powerful and influential financial institutions of the Renaissance, cementing the Medici family's status as key financial players and later as major patrons of art and culture. However, Giovanni's death in 1429 would not mark the end of the Medici influence. His son, Cosimo, wouldn't just expand his father's legacy, he arguably would eclipse it by leaps and bounds. In the historical landscape of the Medici family, Cosimo de' Medici emerges as a pivotal figure, transforming Florence into a cradle of Renaissance art and culture. Indeed, Francesco Guicciardini, 
the renowned author of The History of Italy, encapsulates Cosimo's influence eloquently by stating, Cosimo de' Medici was a citizen of rare wisdom and inestimable riches, and therefore most celebrated all over Europe, especially because he had spent over 400,000 ducats in building churches, monasteries, and other sumptuous edifices not only in his own country, but in many other parts of the world, doing all this with admirable magnificence and truly regal spirit, since he'd been more concerned with immortalizing his name than providing for his descendants. Now, one of the keys to Cosimo's power was a governance structure known as the Citizen Signoria. Within it, Florence was administrated by a group of nine officials, chosen bi-monthly by the city's guilds. This arrangement facilitated Cosimo's substantial influence, enabling him to preside over the city with a quasi-monarchical authority, despite its republican framework. And Cosimo's approach to consolidating power was subtle yet effective. Instead of relying on brute force, he favoured the arts as a means of reaffirming the Medici's dominance, truly evident in his commission of artworks that portrayed him as mythological figures like Orpheus. This practice of self-glorification through art would become a hallmark of the Medici dynasty, extending to future generations. But Cosimo's most enduring legacy lies in his patronage of the arts. He supported luminaries such as Fra Angelico, Fra Filippo Lippi, and Donatello, and his commitment to culture further extended beyond the visual arts. For example, he was instrumental in the establishment and stocking of the public library in Florence, and to ensure the library's richness, he employed a book scout tasked with acquiring manuscripts from Greek and Islamic sources. And in a move that was both innovative and impactful, Cosimo is said to have pioneered the practice of channeling personal wealth into public projects, particularly in the realm of architecture and urban development. This approach marked a significant departure from the prevailing norms of the time, where private wealth was often hoarded or spent on personal luxuries. Through these endeavors, Cosimo not only cemented his family's legacy, but also set a precedent for the fusion of private wealth and public benefit, a concept that would profoundly shape the cultural and architectural landscape of Florence. And among his most notable contributions was overseeing the completion of the dome of the Florence Cathedral, a marvel of engineering helmed by Filippo Brunelleschi. Cosimo believed that such grand undertakings were the only true path to immortalizing his family's name. Vespasiano da Bisticci, his biographer, captures Cosimo's reflections on his legacy. Cosimo once said that the great mistake of his life was that he did not begin to spend his wealth ten years earlier, because, knowing well the nature of his city, he was sure that in the lapse of fifty years no memory would endure of himself or of his house, save the few remains he might have built. However, despite their close ties with the papacy, the Medicis were not exempt from religious scrutiny, particularly regarding the alleged sin of usury, the practice of charging excessive interest on loans. The Medici family navigated this challenge with strategic financial maneuvers, and as historical accounts suggest, the Medici family came up with several ingenious ways of avoiding the church's definition of usury while still making a profit on the money they loaned. One way they did this was by offering loans to trading partners in return for access to below the market rate prices. For instance, they would lend to English wool merchants in return for being able to buy wool cheaper than their trading competitors. Furthermore, Cosimo's life was marked not just by cultural achievements, but also by political power. He became the Duke of Ferrara and served as a banker to Venice, and his influence and power were such that even amidst political rivalries and a brief exile from Florence, his contributions to the city and the country were undeniable. Following the death of Cosimo de' Medici in 1466, he was posthumously honored with the title Pater Patriae, which translates to Father of the Country. Cosimo's son, Piero di Cosimo de' Medici, succeeded him in the family's leadership. However, Piero's tenure at the helm of the Medici dynasty was brief. He passed away just three years later in 1469 due to lung disease. However, it would be Piero's son, Lorenzo de' Medici, often referred to as Lorenzo the Magnificent, who would perhaps outdo all Medici family members before and after him in power and cultural prominence. Now, when you think of the Medici's connection to the Renaissance, you are most likely thinking of the contributions given by the family during the reign of Lorenzo de' Medici, aptly nicknamed the Magnificent. 
His blend of studiousness and diplomatic prowess brought unprecedented prosperity and renown to the Medici name, and Lorenzo's era represented a shift in the family's image, marked by a more flamboyant and grandiose approach. Born in 1449 in Florence, Lorenzo's early life was steeped in the rich cultural and political environment of Florence, and he quickly exhibited a keen intellect and a strong interest in the arts and literature. He received an education that was comprehensive for its time, encompassing not only the humanities and classics, but also an understanding of politics and economics. And he indeed received tutelage under some of the era's most respected scholars. He studied under notable teachers like Gentile de Becchi and Marsilio Ficino. Ficino, a key figure in the revival of Neoplatonism, deeply influenced Lorenzo's philosophical and cultural outlook. And Lorenzo's early life was further marked by his engagement in the family's banking business and diplomatic missions. He accompanied his father on various diplomatic endeavors, providing him with first-hand experience in the complex world of Italian politics. In 1466, at the age of 17, he was instrumental in resolving a dispute between the city's leading families, showcasing his emerging talents in negotiation and conflict resolution. And in 1469, following the death of his father, the 20-year-old Lorenzo assumed the leadership of the Medici family. Despite his youth, he quickly demonstrated remarkable diplomatic skills and a deep understanding of the intricate power dynamics at play in Renaissance Italy. Now, Lorenzo's era represented a shift in the Medici family's approach to their public image and influence. While maintaining the family's traditional roles in banking and commerce, Lorenzo adopted a more flamboyant and grandiose style. For example, he was known for his lavish lifestyle and his magnificent celebrations and festivals, which not only showcased the Medici family's wealth, but also reinforced their status as cultural leaders. Furthermore, under Lorenzo's guidance, the Medici became synonymous with the flowering of Renaissance art and culture. Two of the most notable beneficiaries of his patronage were Michelangelo and Sandro Botticelli, both of whom spent significant time learning their craft at the Medici Palace, an epicenter of Renaissance art and intellectualism. For instance, Michelangelo, who came under Lorenzo's patronage at a young age, was given an unparalleled opportunity to study under the tutelage of the prominent artist Bertoldo di Giovanni at the Medici's own sculpture garden. This garden housed an impressive collection of classical statues, which greatly influenced Michelangelo's early development as a sculptor. And the Medici Palace is thus seen as both a home and a vibrant artistic workshop for Michelangelo, where he was exposed to the philosophical and artistic discussions that were a staple of Lorenzo's court. Similarly, Sandro Botticelli benefited greatly from Lorenzo's patronage by staying at the Medici Palace, with Botticelli being exposed to the same intellectually stimulating environment that nurtured Michelangelo. Botticelli's work, renowned for its expressive portrayal of mythological and religious themes, reflects the Neoplatonic ideals that were popular in Lorenzo's circle and passed on from his aforementioned tutor. His famous works, such as The Birth of Venus and Primavera, are believed to have been commissioned by the Medici and are indicative of the creative freedom and support that Lorenzo provided. Indeed, Lorenzo's fascination with splendor and beauty is evident in his own writings. In an unfinished commentary on love and beauty, he mused, and above all, love is the cause that leads men to worthy and excellent endeavors and leads them to practice and to turn into action those virtues that are potentially in our soul. Therefore, whoever diligently seeks the true definition of love finds it to be nothing other than an appetite for beauty. Furthermore, under Lorenzo's leadership, the Medici family's financial influence reached new heights, with the gold florin of the Medici bank becoming the standard currency throughout Italy and parts of Europe. Additionally, Lorenzo directed the family's interest towards the alum trade, vital for the cloth industry. The Medici bank secured a papal monopoly over the alum mines at Tolfa, and in a rare show of force, the Medici even deployed soldiers to sack Volterra, a competing region, thereby consolidating their control over the alum market. Indeed, during Lorenzo's tenure, the Medici family was considered the wealthiest in Europe. However, this period was also marked by financial extravagance, with loans issued that were never recovered. This unsustainable spending eventually led to the depletion of the bank's reserves just two years after Lorenzo's death in 1494. 
Consequently, the Medici lost control of the Papal treasury to the Pazzi family, their longtime rivals who had previously attempted to assassinate Lorenzo and successfully killed his brother. The Medici's fortunes took a turn for the worse under the rule of Lorenzo's eldest son, also named Piero, dubbed Piero the Unfortunate, leading to their exile. However, the Medici narrative was far from over. A potential path back to power emerged when Giovanni, another son of Lorenzo, ascended to the position of cardinal, opening a new chapter in the family's storied history. The Medici family's journey through history reached an extraordinary pinnacle with the elevation of Giovanni de' Medici, Lorenzo the Magnificent's second son, to the papacy as Pope Leo X in 1513. His ascension to the highest echelon of the Catholic Church marked a moment of unparalleled influence for the Medici family, arguably surpassing even the remarkable achievements of his father. Now, Pope Leo X's tenure at the Vatican, commencing in the early 16th century, was distinguished by the continuation of the Medici's enduring tradition of artistic patronage. Despite the onerous duties inherent in the papal role, Leo X remained deeply committed to the arts, honoring the cultural legacy of his ancestors. This commitment is exemplified by Raphael's renowned portrait of the Medici family, a work that not only showcases Raphael's extraordinary artistic talent, but also embodies the Medici family's stature and their close ties with some of the most celebrated artists of the Renaissance. However, Pope Leo X's papacy also intersected with a turbulent period in the history of the Catholic Church. In Protestantism, Leo X is often associated with the controversial practice of selling indulgences, particularly those linked to the funding for the reconstruction of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. This practice, aimed at raising funds for the lavish project, was a significant factor that led to the Protestant Reformation and Martin Luther's 95 Theses, which critiqued the sale of indulgences among other church practices, directly challenged the policies of Pope Leo X. In response, Leo issued the papal bull Serge Domini in 1520, condemning Luther's theses and further entrenching the division between the Catholic Church and the nascent Protestant movement. And this papal bull represented an outright rejection of the Reformation and set the stage for ongoing religious conflicts. Pope Leo X's reign, therefore, was a period marked by both cultural flourishing and significant religious strife. While he continued the Medici tradition of fostering the arts, his papacy also coincided with one of the most critical periods in the history of Christianity, and his actions and decisions during this time had lasting implications, not just for the Medici family and the Catholic Church, but also for the broader course of European history. And following Pope Leo X, another Medici ascended to the papacy, Clement VII, presiding over a tumultuous era in the Vatican's history. His reign, which began in 1524 at the tail end of the Italian Renaissance, was characterized by a series of political, military and religious challenges that had profound implications for Christianity and world politics. You see, before becoming Pope, Clement VII had established himself as a skilled statesman, serving with distinction as the chief advisor to his cousin during his papacy and to Pope Adrian VI from 1522 to 1523. But when Clement VII himself assumed the papacy, it was a time of crisis, with the Protestant Reformation fast spreading, the church nearing bankruptcy, and Italy under the threat of foreign invasions. Clement VII initially sought to unify Christendom, and tried to liberate Italy from foreign occupation, seeing it as a threat to the church's freedom. However, the complex political landscape of the 1520s, including the Protestant Reformation led by Martin Luther, a power struggle in Italy between the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V and Francis I of France, and Turkish invasions led by Suleiman the Magnificent, severely hampered his efforts. Further complicating matters was King Henry VIII of England's controversial divorce, which led to England's break from the Catholic Church. The height of his challenges came in 1527 with the sack of Rome, during which Clement himself was imprisoned. His eventual escape from the Castel Sant'Angelo led to a compromise position where he allied with Charles V, his former captor, diminishing the independence of the church and the papal states. Despite these challenges, Clement VII was seen as a man of respectability and devoutness. He was noted for his dignified character, theological and scientific knowledge, and astute political insight, and he also left a significant cultural legacy in line with the Medici tradition. 
He was another family patron of the arts, commissioning works from renowned artists like Raphael, Benvenuto Cellini, and Michelangelo, including the iconic The Last Judgment in the Sistine Chapel. In the realm of science, Clement is notable for his 1533 approval of Nicholas Copernicus's theory that the Earth revolves around the Sun, a groundbreaking endorsement nearly a century before Galileo Galilei's trial for similar ideas. Thus, Clement VII's papacy, marked by considerable strife and challenges, reflects a complex interplay of religion, politics and culture during a transformative era in European history. His contributions to art and science, however, underscore the enduring Medici legacy of patronage and intellectual curiosity. Indeed, the Medicis would need a bit of grit and endurance after the reign of Clement VII, for their empire was soon to decline, as we'll see in the next chapter. Following Clement VII's death, the Medici family encountered a labyrinth of challenges leading to their decline, and central to these tribulations was the faltering Medici Bank. Once the pinnacle of European finance, the bank grappled with liquidity issues post Cosimo Medici's demise in 1464. Liquidity, indeed the lifeblood of Renaissance banking, meant ready cash or assets easily convertible to cash, and the bank's inability to maintain this crucial balance amid the burgeoning economies of Italy's city-states signalled its impending crisis. Its successors, bereft of Cosimo's financial acumen, indulged in lavish lifestyles, draining the bank's resources. Consequently, within three decades, the Medici Bank stumbled to its downfall, and the family's woes were compounded by a brewing succession crisis. The absence of a legitimate male heir left the Medici lineage teetering on the brink of oblivion, and Ippolito and Alessandro, both seen as illegitimate, along with the infant Catherine, found themselves at the center of a familial vortex. You see, Catherine, her path to power obstructed by the rigid gender norms of the time, could only watch as the family's influence waned. And this period, marred by uncertainty and political instability, saw the Medici's grip on Florence's political levers loosen as rival factions within the city sensed an opportunity to dismantle their once unassailable dominance. The Medici's height of power reached its final end with the death of Gian Gastone de' Medici in 1737. You see, ascending to power in 1723, Gian Gastone's reign was shadowed by his ill health and an apparent disinterest in public affairs. Despite this, his popularity amongst the Tuscans was undeniable, a sentiment that turned to collective mourning with his passing. Certainly, Gian Gastone's death not only marked the end of his reign, but also heralded the cessation of Medici rule, a dynasty that had shaped the fortunes of Europe for centuries. However, despite their political and financial decline, the Medici's impact, especially in the arts and culture, endured. In a final act of devotion to her city, Anna Maria Luisa, the last Medici heiress, bequeathed the family's extensive art collection to Florence. This grand gesture immortalized the Medici name, ensuring that their legacy would be celebrated and remembered through the ages. Additionally, in Rome, the grandeur of St. Peter's Basilica, one of the largest churches in the world and a masterpiece of Renaissance architecture, is in part a tribute to the Medici popes. Their patronage and vision were pivotal in the creation of this iconic structure, exemplifying their commitment to the arts and their influence in shaping religious and cultural landmarks. And Florence, the cradle of the Renaissance and the Medici's stronghold, houses the Cathedral of Santa Maria del Fiore, famously known as the Duomo. Its dome, a work of unparalleled architectural genius by Filippo Brunelleschi, stands as a symbol of the Medici's dedication to architectural innovation and grandeur. And the Medici's architectural influence in Florence extended further to several other landmark structures. The Uffizi Gallery, conceived by Giorgio Vasari, served dual purposes as both an office hub and a display for the Medici art collection. The opulent Boboli Gardens, the formidable Belvedere Fortress, the Medici Chapel with its ornate tombs, and the Palazzo Medici, the family's original domicile, all stand as enduring symbols of the Medici's imprint on Florence. And although their power is greatly diminished, the Medicis are survived by modern-day family members such as Prince Lorenzo dei Medici. To him, the name isn't merely a birthright, but a stewardship which requires him to uphold the values that Cosimo and Lorenzo the Magnificent strive towards. 
During an interview with Oat Living, he declared that being a Medici has taught me that you need to always have vision and be forward thinking, but also to consider others in that equation in a philanthropic way. You use your wealth for prosperity of your community and the state, in addition to your family for advancement in culture and in the humanities, fine arts and sciences. You need to give charity to other people in order to elevate society. Thus, the Medici name doesn't stand only for power or wealth, but also for the creation of prosperity and innovation for the community and the world around us. Italian history is perhaps humanity's most magnificent stage, dominated by princes and popes, artists and emperors, designers and sculptors, stretching back millennia. When conversations turn to the most formidable dynasties of Italy, our thoughts immediately drift to the ancient Romans or the spiritual might of popes. Yet, lurking in the shadows of these giants, there exists an old money family that is not as frequently discussed outside of Italy, but whose power and influence over the country are unmatched in modern history. It's a dynasty not necessarily filled with emperors or pontiffs, but filled with kings and queens, a family unlike any other, who managed to weave the fragmented fabric of Italian city-states into a unified kingdom, standing tall amidst the tumults of European politics, the Napoleonic incursions, and the cataclysms of two world wars. In today's episode, we dive into the epic narrative of a family whose influence has been the cornerstone in creating modern Italy as we know it. But our story takes an intriguing turn when we explore a period where their power became so overwhelming that it threatened the established order, leading to an unprecedented decision, exile. This segment of their history highlights the paradox of their legacy. Their ability to unify and govern was so formidable that it incited fear among their contemporaries, prompting rulers and political factions to force them into exile, as we describe the Savoy dynasty, the old money family that created modern Italy. The Savoy family, at their peak, hasn't just had mere power or influence. Indeed, such terms fall as understatements when dealing with such a dominant old money family. In fact, if you were to gaze your eyes over a timeline of Italian monarchs, you would see that the Savoy dynasty held power in Italy for the best part of 1,000 years, from the 11th century to 1946. And, despite being ousted by the Italian Republic in 1946, many still regard the Savoys to be the de facto royal family of Italy to this very day. Indeed, perhaps the most notable current member of this illustrious lineage is still kicking around with a regal title. Emanuele Filiberto isn't just any prince, he's the Prince of Venice, thanks to his grandfather, Umberto II, who had a blink-and-you'll-miss-it reign as the last king of Italy. Born in exile thanks to Italy's ban of the Savoy male heirs, Emanuele's since made his grand Italian comeback, diving into a smorgasbord of entrepreneurial and media gigs with the flair of a prince turned mogul. And holding the baton as the would-be Savoy heir, he's not just resting on his laurels, he's hustling hard. Even a net worth of $100 million and a fantasy castle is not enough to satisfy a member of House Savoy. From presiding over the International Association of the Dynastic Orders of the House of Savoy to shaking it on Italy's Dancing with the Stars, he's a prince on a mission. And did we mention the fashion brand and the political party dreams he had about restoring the monarchy? Yes, he's got those too. As for the internal royal rumble, Emanuele Filiberto's dance card is full with dynastic disputes, notably with a distant cousin claiming the family throne. It's like Game of Thrones, but with less blood, more legal paperwork, and because it's in Italy, much better attire. Then there's his daughter, Vittoria di Savoia, stepping into the spotlight as the first female heir in a millennium, smashing through the glass ceiling with her tiara. At 17, this Gen Z Italian princess is juggling the weight of a thousand-year legacy with the life of a modern influencer and aspiring fashion designer. Currently, Paris, France, is her playground but she's got her eyes set on more than just the runways. Meanwhile, Prince Aimone, the distant cousin of Emmanuel and the other claimant for the Italian throne, is caught in a title tussle that reads like a royal soap opera. He's the Duke of Aosta, but it's a crown of thorns, with family feuds and contested claims. Beyond the noble squabbles, he's also dabbling in diplomacy and the tire business. Because why not? He's a Savoy. Thus, 
The Savoy's legacy isn't just about ruling, it's about leaving a mark. Even in exile, they dreamt big, aiming to reclaim their crown jewels, a dazzling hoard of diamonds and pearls that could rival any royal Instagram feed, and they're not done yet. The family's home city of Turin, for instance, is home to not one, not two, but 11 unique palaces, containing rooms full of everything a ruler could ever wish for, from the royal armory to a private royal theater. It seems that when you're as powerful as a Savoy, the idea of sitting next to a member of the common folk is not one that even enters your mind. Furthermore, it is important to note that without the efforts that the Savoy dynasty went to unify Italy, there may well have been no kingdom to rule in the first place. They were arguably the only family throughout the history of Italy to ever stand a chance of unifying the country. This feat alone exemplifies their dominance completely. However, it wasn't just military might and geographical control that the Savoy exerted. Many members of this illustrious family were also loved by the Italian people. Margherita of Savoy, for instance, was so loved by the people whom she visited in their schools and hospitals that they named the Margherita Pizza, a pizza which represents the Italian flag after her. This same name has been carried forward for centuries and is now firmly embedded in Italian culture. So, it's undeniable that the Savoy family was, and in many ways continues to be, one of the most dominant that Italy has ever seen. But where did this all begin? To answer that question, we need to travel back, not to a part of Italy, but interestingly, to southern France. Yes, this great Italian family didn't start its journey in Italy. Instead, the name Savoy actually originates from the Savoia region in the south of France, with most historians placing the birth of what would become the Savoy dynasty with Humbert I, who acquired the county of Savoy, among other areas, to the east of the Rhine River in 1003. But it wasn't until Humbert's son, Otto of Savoy, ascended to the leader of the family that the Savoys began to take an interest in the beauty of Italy. This arose out of his marriage to the Marchioness Adelaide of Turin, which effectively gave the family control of the then small towns of Turin and Pinerolo. Now, in the 11th century, Italy was a patchwork of power struggles, far from the ideal battleground for ambitious small-time nobles seeking to extend their dominion. That's where the Normans come in, a group of audacious warriors from the north of France, known for their military prowess and strategic acumen. See, they had set their sights on the lush landscapes of southern Italy, embroiled in a protracted campaign to cement their influence. And amid this contentious backdrop, Otto of Savoy made a series of calculated maneuvers that would defy the odds. By securing the cities of Piedmont and Suburbia, Otto didn't just gain territories. He acquired key chess pieces in the complex game of medieval politics. These towns were crucial, not just for their strategic locations that bridged gaps between various trade routes, but also for their potential to bolster the family's influence. Piedmont, with its fertile valleys, and Suburbia, a gateway to the Alps, became the foundation stones upon which the Savoy dynasty would build its legacy, turning a challenging era into a stepping stone towards greatness. And Otto's successors continued this modest expansion. And though small, the house did begin to grow their influence and cement power in the following years. Amadeus V, for instance, introduced the law of primogeniture, passing the dynasty's power to the firstborn male, to the house in the latter part of the 13th century, thereby ensuring that the family's assets would not be fragmented upon the death of the house leader. And his grandson, Amadeus VII, made a particularly significant advancement in the late 1300s, capturing the port of Nice in France. With a port, new trade routes were opened for the Savoys, bolstering their still modest power significantly. Then, in 1416, the Holy Roman Emperor Sigismund, recognizing the ever-rising power of the house, promoted the then leader, Amadeus VIII, to Duke of Savoy. This elevation from simple regional lords to official dukes was a monumental leap, marking the Savoys as key players on the European stage. It gave the upstart family political legitimacy and opened avenues for strategic alliances, significantly enhancing their influence. Therefore, the advancement not only solidified the Savoy's authority over their territories, but also forecasted a promising future ripe with opportunities for expansion and increased prestige. However, in a surprising twist, 
a period of incredibly weak rulers followed, putting this trajectory to a grinding halt. Family rulers such as Amadeus VIII's son, Louis, and Philbert II lacked the political savvy and military prowess necessary to safeguard their domain. Therefore, Louis's indecisiveness and Philbert II's focus on personal pursuits over statecraft weakened the Savoy, making it ripe for conquest. Their leadership was so poor, in fact, that the Savoys lost control of their land to the French in 1536. Therefore, to regain his family's lands, leader Emmanuel Philibert made a tactical move to serve France's primary enemy, the Habsburgs, serving as governor of the Netherlands from 1555 to 1559. During this time, Philbert led the Spanish to victory at St. Quentin and subsequently used his newfound force to slowly regain his lands. While the other houses quibbled over politics, House Savoy slowly reaffirmed its status, notably recapturing both Turin and Nice. Toward the turn of the century, therefore, House Savoy had affirmed itself as a major player in the ongoing battle for European dominance, and in the following years, their status only rose to new heights. Following in his father's footsteps, Emmanuel II devoted his life to improving the status of the Savoy family in the 17th century. Notably, he drastically improved the economic welfare of Turin, helping it to become a more significant force in the European market. Emmanuel also took advantage of the port of Nice, developing a road through the perilous French Alps and opening up trade routes to France. With this newfound economic stability, coupled with political savvy, House Savoy only continued to grow throughout the 17th century until a perilous war of succession broke out in Spain. The war was a pivotal moment in deciding the balance of power in Europe, as its outcome would determine the distribution of the assets of the Spanish Empire, which crumbled after the death of King Charles II. Savoy leader Victor Amadeus chose to again side with the Habsburgs, and this decision single-handedly changed the trajectory of the House of Savoy forever. Specifically, the war's complexity and the shifting allegiances underscored the diplomatic acuity of Victor Amadeus. And his decision to side with the Habsburgs, led by Emperor Leopold I and later his sons, Joseph I and Charles VI, showcased his ability to navigate the volatile European political landscape. And though this alliance was not without risks, Victor Amadeus's gamble paid off when the Treaty of Utrecht was concluded in 1713. Now this treaty was a series of agreements that reshaped the map of Europe, ending the War of the Spanish Succession. It redistributed territories among the warring powers, and for Victor Amadeus of the House of Savoy, it brought an unprecedented reward. In recognition of his contributions to the Habsburg victory, the treaty elevated him from Duke of Savoy to King of Sicily. Indeed, House Savoy had, after centuries of work, finally reached the status of monarchs. Their rule of Sicily would only last seven years, however, as the War of the Quadruple Alliance forced them to exchange their kingdom for Sardinia in 1720. Although initially a setback, rule over the Kingdom of Sardinia actually proved to be very fruitful for the Savoys. With Sardinia as their new power base, the Savoys adeptly exploited the subsequent wars of the Polish and Austrian successions. Their strategic acumen during these conflicts enabled them to annex parts of the Duchy of Milan, significantly bolstering their mainland holdings. Yet, as the French Revolution shook the foundations of monarchies across Europe, the Kingdom of Sardinia under the Savoy's rule stood in opposition to the rising tide of revolutionary fervor. Their defiance culminated in a confrontation with Napoleon at the Battle of Mondovi in 1796, a clash that ended in a stinging defeat for the Savoys, casting a long shadow over their realm's political fortunes. Notably, the kingdom was forced to bend the knee and sign the Treaty of Paris, giving the French free roam to march through the Savoy's region of Piedmont. Further unrest followed in 1798, as King Charles Emmanuel IV was forced to abdicate the throne in favor of his brother Felix. Luckily, this family squabble did not ruin the kingdom, which was restored in 1814 with the addition of advantageous new territories such as Genoa. In the following decades, power in the Savoy kingdom continued to grow to a point where, by the coronation of King Charles Albert in 1831, the Savoys were widely regarded as the best force to unite the tattered fragments of the Italian kingdoms. Specifically, 
Their strategic marriages and territorial expansions during the 18th century had significantly enhanced their prestige and influence, and they were perceived as less threatening by other Italian rulers and more palatable to foreign powers, who were wary of a strong, unified Italy. Embracing the winds of change, Charles Albert Asavi introduced the Statuto Albertino in 1848, a forward-looking constitution that promised civil liberties and established a parliamentary system, laying the groundwork for the Kingdom of Italy with the Savoys as their monarch. From this point forward, the Savoys were officially the rulers, not just of a few cities, but the entirety of Italy. However, almost as soon as this unification began, the influence of the Savoy family started to dwindle as the idea of a parliamentary system based on equality started to gain traction. This shift was not merely a political transition, but also a reflection of changing societal values, increasingly at odds with the idea of hereditary rule. And the decline in public support for the monarchy was precipitated by specific events that underscored the growing chasm between the royal family and the Italian people. One such event was the tragic massacre of protesters by King Charles Albert's forces in 1865, a brutal suppression of dissent that left an irremovable stain on the monarchy's reputation. And this event was not isolated. The monarchy's image suffered further damage under King Umberto I, particularly due to his endorsement of the Bava Beccaris massacre in 1898, where troops fired on demonstrators protesting against rising bread prices, resulting in numerous casualties. King Umberto's praise for General Fiorenzo Bava Beccaris, the architect of this bloody repression, exacerbated public outrage. Consequently, the culmination of this mounting discontent was the assassination of King Umberto I in July 1900 by the anarchist Gaetano Bresci. Bresci, motivated by a desire to avenge the victims of the Bava Beccaris massacre and to protest the monarchy's oppressive actions, symbolized the deep-seated resentment against a dynasty increasingly viewed as out of touch with the aspirations of a modern unified Italy. Thus, this series of events illustrates a dramatic reversal of fortune for the Savoy family, who, having ascended to the zenith of power through the unification of Italy, found their legacy tarnished and their authority challenged by the very forces of progress and unity they had helped to unleash. Almost as soon as the family reached the peak of their power, they seemingly had it all taken away. Now, public opinion settled after this crescendo of violence until the First World War broke out in 1914, and the consequences of this catastrophic war were particularly onerous to Italy. And because various promises made by the rest of Europe in the Treaty of Versailles were broken, Italy's economy crumbled. In this landscape, the ideas of fascism began to grow in a large contingent of the public's mind. And in 1922, a pivotal figure, Benito Mussolini, led a fascist protest, later dubbed the March on Rome, outside of the country's capital. The state of affairs rose to a point in which Prime Minister Luigi Facta declared a state of siege on Rome which, if approved, would allow the army to deal with the fascists. However, to be passed, it needed royal assent. King Victor Emmanuel III, a member of the House of Savoy, who had ascended to the throne amidst these tumultuous times, faced a dilemma of historic proportions. His refusal to sign the order for a state of siege was not a decision made lightly, but was influenced by a complex web of factors. Foremost among these was his concern over the potential for civil war, which seemed an all-too-possible outcome if the army was deployed against the fascists. Indeed, the king feared that such a conflict could tear the nation apart and undermine the very fabric of the Italian state. Additionally, there was a lack of confidence in the loyalty of the army to the monarchy, raising doubts about the effectiveness of such a move. Moreover, Victor Emmanuel III was acutely aware of the widespread support Mussolini had managed to amass, not only among the general populace, but also within key segments of the Italian elite, including the business community and even parts of the military. Given these considerations, the king's refusal to sign the order was driven by a calculated, albeit controversial, bid to avoid bloodshed and preserve the monarchy's position within the rapidly changing political landscape of Italy. His decision, however, had far-reaching implications. On the 28th of October 1922, faced with Mussolini's unwavering demand for control and the apparent inevitability of his ascent to power, King Victor Emmanuel III capitulated. 
Mussolini was invited to form a government, a move that effectively sanctioned the fascist takeover and marked the beginning of a new authoritarian chapter in Italian history. Under the rule of Mussolini, the practices of democracy, the rule of law and respect for the constitution were quickly forgotten. By the end of the decade, the power of the monarchy was a mere fantasy and Mussolini had the de facto control of the kingdom. War and brutal violence ensued, starting in 1936, when Mussolini conquered Ethiopia, giving Victor Emmanuel the title of emperor. Albania was also conquered in 1939, before joining the Axis powers in World War II. As the Italian court watched the terrors that the Axis powers committed throughout the World War II years, it became clear that something had to be done. Thus, on the 24th of July, 1943, Emmanuel dismissed Mussolini from office after a vote of no confidence was reached, and in September of the same year, the government announced that it was siding with the Allies. The fascist contingent still present in Italy was gradually removed in the following years. However, throughout this course of political events, one thing could not be forgotten. Victor Emmanuel had originally shown support for Mussolini. In the eyes of much of the public, it was this king of the House of Savoy, and him alone, who granted this plague into Italian governance. And because of this, for the public, he could not be trusted in the post-war years. Aware of this, and desperate to keep the Savoy name alive, Victor Emmanuel transferred the majority of his powers to his son, Umberto, in 1944. After Rome was liberated around two months later, Emmanuel crowned his son Lieutenant General of the realm. However, public opinion was still divided, and in 1946, a referendum was held to decide whether Italy should retain the monarchy. To try and sway public opinion, Victor Emmanuel formally abdicated on the 9th of May, thereby crowning his son king. However, the damage had already been done, and nothing Victor Emmanuel could have ever done would have changed the fact that he seen as the reason Mussolini rose to power. The anti-monarchists received 54% of the vote, and Victor Emmanuel was swiftly exiled to Egypt, where he drew his last breath just a year later. Therefore, the 12th of June 1946 saw the official dissolution of the Kingdom of Italy, and Umberto formally transferred his powers to the Prime Minister Alcide de Gasperi before being exiled to Portugal, where he remained until his death in 1983. Italy's new constitution also provided that any descendants of the Savoy family would, like their former king, be banned from entering the country. This ban was eventually dropped back in 2002 on the condition that Vittorio Emanuele, the last rightful claimant of the Savoy dynasty, renounced any claim to the throne. However, before this exile was lifted, the once so powerful family reportedly engaged in some, shall we say, murky activities. In 1991, for instance, Vittorio was found guilty of unauthorized possession of a firearm after a 13-year court proceeding surrounding the death of Dirk Hamer. Later, in 2006, he was arrested and imprisoned in Potenza for corruption and recruitment of prostitutes. Luckily for him, he only slept in a prison cell for a few nights before being removed and placed under house arrest. After serving his sentence, Vittorio did eventually make a legal return to Italy in 2002 before trying and failing to claim a compensatory figure of 260 million euros for the exile. They didn't stay in Italy for long though, choosing to remain at their castle in Geneva, Switzerland. Now, because of this deep and rather polarizing history, you may be under the assumption that in the 21st century, the Savoy family have little in the way of influence and power. However, this couldn't be further from the truth. For one thing, all of the former residences of the Savoy family have been protected as a World Heritage Site. This means that, even when the last living Savoy draws their last breath, they will still have a hold on the land of Italy, in one way or another. Furthermore, the members of the Savoy family, despite having all claims to the throne and royal powers renounced, have kept their royal names. Vittorio, up until his death, for instance, had the title Prince of Naples, despite having no real claim to the city. Ultimately, the story of the Savoy dynasty, unfolding over centuries, is a rich blend of victories and challenges. Their heritage, marked by both admiration and debate, underscores their significant influence on Italian history, and without a doubt, Italy's past would have been vastly different without the Savoy name. As the Fiat factory pulsates with vitality in the year 1920, 
we find the dynamic Giovanni Agnelli surveying the labyrinth of his automotive kingdom. Hopes of power and control echo in his thoughts, twirling like shadowy dancers in a mysterious ballet. A startling ripple breaks through the harmony of the factory as a hush-voiced messenger steals his way in, bearing a secret note from the infamous Benito Mussolini. Retreating to the quiet safety of his office, Agnelli meticulously studies the plea. As he does, Mussolini's eerie figure appears as a shadow against the wall, casting an ominous sign of the perilous alliance to come. It's an alliance, a pact sealed in the secrecy of this room, that would act as a springboard, hurling the Agnellis into an unstoppable spiral of controversial power and political influence. This was only the prologue to a saga that would see the birth of the highly debated Bilderberg Group, further deepening the family's intricate web of power and dominion. Join us today on this episode of Old Money Luxury as we explore the epic rise to power and controversial continuing influence of one of Europe's old money car dynasties, the Agnellis of Italy. In the hallowed tomes of automobile history, the name Giovanni Agnelli reverberates like a sonic boom. Born in 1866 in the charming Piedmontese hamlet of Villa Perosa, he hailed from an affluent lineage of landowners. Trained as an officer at Modena's military academy, Giovanni seemed destined for a life in uniform until the allure of late 19th century innovation swerved his path. Young Giovanni fell under the spell of the automobile. In 1899, with a group of associates, he laid the cornerstone for Fabrica Italiana di Automobili Torino, soon to be affectionately known as Fiat. An ardent racing aficionado, Agnelli garnered numerous accolades. Still, his fortunes took a significant stride with the outbreak of war, first against Libya in 1911 and later World War I. His contribution to these battles was not on the field, but behind the lines supplying an arsenal of trucks, machine guns, aircraft engines and ambulances. From a humble beginning of a mere 50 employees, Fiat boomed to a workforce of over 10,000 by 1915, necessitating a brand new factory, the Lingotto, to keep up with the demand. Situated in the southern suburbs of Turin, it echoed Henry Ford's business model with assembly line production and division of labor. The company broadened further with the establishment of the Mirafiori factory on Turin's outskirts. It was during this whirlwind phase of development that, in the shadowy corridors of power, Agnelli's path intertwined with none other than Benito Mussolini in 1914. Subscribing to the ideology of you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, Agnelli financially backed Mussolini's political ambitions. As a return for the favor, when accusations of war profiteering clouded Fiat and other corporations, Mussolini conveniently swept them under the rug. Soon, the 1920s saw Agnelli's empire sprawl into various sectors. He established his footprint in media by acquiring a significant stake in La Stampa, one of Italy's top newspapers. Additionally, he would dabble in other industries like tractors, railways, ships and planes. Notably, he founded a bank, facilitating customers to buy his cars on an easy credit plan. However, the darkest and most profitable chapter of Agnelli's saga involved military equipment. With his 1923 appointment as a lifetime senator and his subsequent joining of Mussolini's fascist party in 1932, he became the go-to supplier for the government and military. This golden period was cut short with Mussolini's fall leading to Agnelli losing his possessions in 1945 and passing away later that year. Furthermore, Giovanni and Umberto Agnelli, grandsons of the aforementioned Giovanni Agnelli, found themselves burdened with a convoluted legacy. Barely adults, they were deemed too young to command such a colossal enterprise. Consequently, the helm of Fiat was handed over to the company's managing director, Vittorio Valletta. Valletta's tenure brought more than mere corporate changes. His stewardship coincided with the birth of a clandestine gathering that has since been the subject of heated controversy, the Bilderberg Group. This semi-secretive assembly involving the creme de la creme of North America and Europe's power elite emerged as a controversial force on the global stage. Their shroud of secrecy has served as a lightning rod for public suspicion. With its meetings, closed to the public and the press, creating an air of mystery and speculation. The group's unwillingness to divulge details of their discussions further fueled these suspicions, leading many to question the nature and purpose of their gatherings. 
Critics argue that such secrecy among the world's most influential figures raises serious concerns about transparency and democracy. These perceptions have created a cloud of controversy that looms large over the group, tying it inexorably to Fiat's legacy through the actions of Vittorio Valletta. Now, as post-war Italy was rebuilt, the Agnelli strengthened their grip on the economy. Fiat's expansive, vertically integrated network encapsulated all aspects of car production. Strategic acquisitions led to their influence, accounting for an estimated 3% of Italy's GDP in the 1980s. With globalization in full swing, Giovanni and Umberto Agnelli saw the need to reach beyond Italy's borders. The operational reins of Fiat were handed over to industry experts, while they diversified into politics and industrial lobbying. Fiat's tale continued to unfold under John Elkin, Agnelli's grandson, and Sergio Marchione, Fiat's appointed president, culminating in the significant acquisition and integration of Chrysler. Now, during this period, the family's audacious investments and strategic acquisitions within the automotive industry painted a vivid picture of power and ambition. In 1969, the illustrious Ferrari brand, a beacon of Italian craftsmanship, high performance and exclusive luxury, fell within the Agnelli family's radar. They saw an opportunity to merge Fiat's industrial prowess with Ferrari's prestigious legacy, acquiring a significant stake. The same year, they expanded their portfolio by investing in Lancia, another stalwart of Italian automotive design renowned for innovative technology and striking aesthetics. Fast forward to 1986, the Agnelli family set their sights on yet another Italian classic, Alfa Romeo. This strategic move underpinned their ambition to form a kind of Italian automotive dynasty, integrating the quintessentially Italian passion for design and performance present in Alfa Romeo with Fiat's expanding empire. Furthermore, during this golden era, Fiat's market share flourished. It experienced remarkable success in various markets, notably in the United Kingdom. The Fiat Uno, a compact hatchback with an economy-friendly price tag and a reputation for reliable performance, became the company's best-selling vehicle in the UK, etching its name on the roads and in the hearts of the British populace. Yet even as the Agnelli family relished these successes, they faced an onslaught of competitive pressures. Automobile manufacturers from Japan and Korea were making their mark, with their technologically advanced, fuel-efficient models proving formidable rivals. The Agnellis, however, never one to back down from a challenge, armed themselves for this global contest. In the battlefield of international automobile production, they exemplified the shrewd might of Italian innovation, resilience and adaptability. Continuing the legacy into the new millennium, John Elkan, Giovanni Agnelli's grandson, along with the appointed president, Sergio Marchione, took the helm of Fiat. Today, under their stewardship, Fiat's tale continues to unfold, echoing the Agnelli family's saga of ambition, power and resilience. As the 2020s unfurl, the Agnellis uphold an impressive degree of power and influence, especially within the automotive industry. The family's wealth, as per recent estimations, stands at a staggering $13.5 billion, speaking to their continued economic prowess. At the helm of this influential family is John Elkin, the grandson of Gianni Agnelli and the chosen heir to both Fiat and the Agnelli legacy. Elkan, over the past 15 years, has been instrumental in orchestrating the revival of the Agnelli empire, leading strategic moves and transformations that have significantly reshaped the family's business landscape. His notable role in the merger of Fiat Chrysler Automobiles and Peugeot stands as a milestone in the family's story, highlighting their adaptability in the face of change. His leadership continues to make waves in the industry as the acting president of Stellantis. As of 2023, Elkan's individual net worth is estimated to be approximately $1.9 billion. Alongside John, the next generation of the Agnelli family includes Lapo Elkan, John's brother and a high-ranking executive within Fiat, and Ginevra Elkan, John's sister. Together, they contribute to the Agnelli family's influence and decision-making power within the realm of automotive and beyond. Yet indeed, the reach of the Agnelli family extends far beyond the boundaries of the automotive industry. Their investments are dispersed across a diverse range of sectors, featuring notable companies like Stellantis, Ferrari and Juventus Football Club. Their financial tentacles have also reached the media industry, 
through a substantial stake in the Italian media conglomerate GDI. John Elkan, in particular, has been proactive in the media sector, showcasing a keen eye for potential opportunities. A prime example of this is his acquisition of a stake in Christian Louboutin, a move that signifies the family's intent to diversify their portfolio further. Thus, the family's continued impact on the global business arena is far-reaching, shaping industries and economies at large. Their propensity for strategic expansion and savvy investments has solidified their place as one of the most influential European business dynasties in contemporary times. As progenitors and custodians of the global automotive colossus, Fiat, and through strategic investments in revered luxury brands such as Ferrari and Alfa Romeo, the Agnelli dynasty has indelibly shaped Italy's economic fabric for over a hundred years, and the Agnelli family's political influence is as pervasive as their economic one. Their control over one of Italy's major newspapers, La Stampa, amplifies their political influence, allowing them to mold public opinion. In short, the Agnelli family, with their formidable business empire and ubiquitous presence in political and economic conversations, often stands as a de facto governing force that profoundly influences Italy's path into the future, for better or worse.